This was predicted a long time ago by some people saw where the world was heading and uh, you know whatever's happening in the world this is actually the doing of people in in power people in governance not really seeing the world for what it is it's it's for you know some of the policies and some of the uh, conversations and some of the things that happen on sort of mainstream media and some of the policies have led us to the point where the world is uh, quite segregated and the platforms we have for communication aren't helping better communication rather it is putting us into silos whether we like it or not and that is um, again I mean I remember I had the privilege of having this conversation with uh, you know Sam and, and a few other people Sam uh, Harris. you know yeah Sam Harris and, and you know and Brian Green and a few people like that um, you know when you watch Terminator uh, the Hollywood's version of the AI uh, apocalypse is just that. It's, it's, it's violent. It's, it's, you know, the machines rising up against you and shootings and things like that where we're in cages and whatnot. But I think the AI revolution is more or less already happening and it is having a huge impact on us. But they are algorithms. You know, we, we just don't realize it is a form of AI. Right. Whatever the information the uh, the person who wrote the code put in here and the uh, uh, outcome from the algorithm in between, we have no idea what led to the algorithm to come up with that stuff because we're too many variables. It's because we can't calculate it, we get the algorithm to do it. And the byproduct of that is unintended consequences that's happening right now. Uh, Facebook and Zuckerberg and, and you know Jack and Twitter and and, and uh, Google can say they're trying to fix the problem, but the business model and the algorithms are built in a manner to appeal to some of the worst uh, impulses of human nature. So with that combined with, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the biggest entertainer or the biggest loudspeaker in the world when it comes to almost anything is American television and American films and uh, American news networks, they set the trend globally. If you look at those trends that have been set, uh, they are quite polarizing, they're quite binary. And that again, add to this sort of ongoing anxiety, you know, this, this, this false narrative from both aisles of, of the spectrum, of the political spectrum, where they're both fighting pure evil, right? Which is fundamentally a myth. Right, because the right thinks they they are righteous and moral, and they're fighting the pure evil. The left thinks the same thing, and I, I'm a. I, I used to be. A, I used to call myself an eternal optimist, but then life happened. So I'm <laughs> a, a, a bit more of a realist optimist now, if that's even a term. I do think we are at a terrible place, and it is not getting any better, but. You know, some people are laying the groundwork. Maybe in five, six, ten years, things will become better. But right now, we're in a pardon my French, but we're in a clusterfuck of a situation, and we're we're just trying to figure out. Okay, what do we do? I'm so glad you're saying this because I think I and us here at the show we feel the exact same way, and. I actually don't think maybe the conversation is starting to happen a little bit more, but I, I act, I'm actually surprised at the conversation around the effect that social media and mainstream media, too. But I think everyone kind of knows what what they're up to. But like especially social media because of the, the algorithms, um, the effect that this is having on us and our conversation and how extreme it's making us, because what you see in your feeds, which are programmed for you specifically and the views that you already have how we think that that's we think that that's what the world is we think that that that's what we're organically getting so so when they have these uh algorithms that just show us more of what we think like how can that not be dangerous and divisive and um it's so funny I don't, to, um, to me and you know what do i know but i feel like it's so obvious that that's not a, it's not a good thing and i get it that they have other you know priorities like you know pleasing their advertisers and and whatnot but i think it's i personally feel like it's kind of why we're in the divisive state that we're in 
I think I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it, it, it's funny because uh, social media then funnels through to mainstream media. There is still a large audience for mainstream media, and social media then also gives rise to uh, in-groups. And those in-groups then have their own little websites and own little places where they consume what they want to consume, right? Uh, before social media, it wasn't as simple to access whatever you want. And you consume sort of, you know, sort of a primarily uh, stuff in the middle. You know, then you make up your own, own mind. Uh, there's a, I remember seeing an article that we just had an election in Australia. And uh, the... Uh, this may be a bit confusing, but uh, the Liberal Party over here are actually conservatives. They use the title Liberal, but they're conservatives. They're like the Republicans. Gotcha. And the Left Party are like the Democrats. Uh, they are small L liberals. Um, and, you know, it was the sure shot uh, the Labour's going to win the election. You know, it's the election they couldn't lose. And guess what? They lost. This so kind um, of what happened know. in America, pretty much, in 2016? Yeah. yeah. And then there was an article I saw by a young woman. Um, uh, she wrote an article saying how she could not comprehend how this happened because she was all of her social media, she, 2,000 plus uh, uh, of her friends and everybody on Facebook, everyone knew they were going to win. But when they didn't, it were like, wait, what did I miss? How did I miss? You know, I know about the echo chambers. I was careful not to be in that bubble but then i realized when we lost whether i like it or not i am forced into that echo chamber which is what you were talking about you know it's super dangerous even when we have a conscious effort i mean i remember uh, having this uh, a debate with somebody not so long ago uh, why i kept some people on my facebook which had extreme views I deliberately kept them so I know their view. Uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, people uh, who are anti-vaccination, who are extreme activists on, on sort of the vegan movement, um, you know, uh, who are have conservative views, pro-guns in Australia. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a thing over here, but I had some people, I deliberately kept them and interacted with them so maybe I could trick the algorithm. Um, but... You know, if you look at the data available, that we can't trick the algorithm. It will give you what you want to know because your subtlest movement, you know, that, that only takes you like, you know, one tenth of a second during scrolling, it's recording it and it's adapting. You can't beat that. Right. And, and think about how much effort that is. Like in you trying to uh you know have people in your algorithms that um are have diverse uh ideologies and, and views you have to go through the effort of trying to click yeah. this trying to connect with that person trying to have this friend and the vast majority of like that's and that's your like goal right vast majority of people are not thinking that way so i, I mean like I, I, on the back of the feminist event i actually removed all social media uh from my mobile uh, I'm still on social media. I uh, use it as part of work during work hours. Uh, I have a small time allocated uh, because, I mean, that event showed me uh, the personal impact it can have on, a, have on somebody because regardless of what you may say, when you have 70,000 people on Twitter talking about uh, something you were part of and the sort of the, 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 the ferocity and, and, and you know, the, the language it can take anyone. Uh, it can take anyone down a really dark rabbit hole. I looked at it, uh, and when my Twitter was blowing up, I'm like, you know what? I just removed it from my. I did not look at some of the things. So you're not even really on social media anymore. I am on social media, uh, you know, but my accounts are uh, carefully pre-planned, you know, in a, you know, in a way. Like you know, I do put things out, but you know, we, I, I do it sort of like you know, when I come to the office. There's a, you know, I have a half an hour, so I just put things out in that half an hour, and then I switch off. Uh, I don't look at it afterwards because it's, I, I know. I, here's the funny thing: I thought I couldn't do that, especially with what what I'm doing. Um, but I'm not information poor because of it. Uh, you know, I'm 
I still read, you know, the news articles and, and consume news the way I need to consume. And I used to consume back in the day, you know, reading the BBCs and, and, and also the ABCs and whatever out there. Um, and I read the books. I listen to the podcasts uh, that I listen to, the diverse range of things. And I still seem to know what's going on. Now, I may not know um, when an incident happened uh, immediately because my Twitter is, uh, as in, you know, I'm not seeing it on Twitter. But I find out about three hours later. But again, that has had zero impact in my life. Oh my gosh. It's so funny you're saying this. I feel like we're kind of the same person. We're going through the same situation because I'm kind of the same in that, you know, with the show, we have, obviously we've put ourselves on social media. We know we have to be involved there, but all of us here at the show, like, especially Twitter, all of us are pretty new to Twitter. And I think that that's probably the most toxic one. We're having, right. we're, we're struggling with it. We are having a hard time with it. And we, we obviously can't not be on it, but um, I went through just not too long ago and unfriended everyone except for like maybe 30 people and they're like comedians and just like like kind of like people that post like nothing um, because I couldn't handle it had nothing to do with agreeing or disagreeing otherwise I would have followed people that I agreed with it had to do with just it's too much information um, and uh, I just put something out the other day. Oh, um, we had on uh, James Lindsay, uh, a former guest of ours. He put out a tweet pretty much posing the question of what's the point of Twitter these days? Um, you know, it's pretty much turned. I don't this isn't what he said, but the way I interpreted it, it was it's pretty much turned into a ranting and, you know, a negativity tunnel. Um, the way that I looked at it was we have so many other platforms for open and free flowing information, which is what the, the point of Twitter was supposed to be. It's like, so why do we even need Twitter anymore? It, it All it's doing is in, inducing anxiety. You know, people think the world is on fire. Um, and uh, I, 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 that's right. I, I put this response of like, I have a group of friends who um, aren't on social media at all, like not even at it, on it um, whatsoever. And they're, so, they're super smart people. They know what's going on in the world and they're doing just fine. And they're not on social media. Yeah. And, and I think there is an argument for that. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I was talking to, again, this is a conversation that I have with many people. And uh, it came up in a conversation, see, uh, when you read a book, when you watch something, you know, like a film and whatnot, there's a range of emotions that are evolved. It's not necessarily uh, happiness. It's not necessarily sadness, not necessarily anger. It's a, it's a collection of things, right? But if you go to a place like Twitter, uh, and, and to a certain degree, some parts on, on Facebook, uh, or the YouTube comment section, what you primarily see is anger, right? People get frustrated or angry about a thing and they leave their anger for you to read. And the next person who's angered by that anger leaves their anger. And you are uh, doing your own thing, you come to that page or you know that, that, that thread and all you just see is just anger permanently there for you to consume. And when you just consume that, you know, it, it, it has an impact. You know, when I see some of the debates that's happening on Facebook, I want to get in there and start just, I'm angry by reading other people's anger. And it's just permanently there. You can't, you know, if you're in that environment, that is a perpetual, uh, you know, thing that happens. I mean, I'm not saying that that's all there is. There's some, you know, really nice uh, Twitter accounts that's just funny, just memes and whatnot. But fundamentally, what seems to be the driving force is it's, it's driven by anger, division, and it is massively stressful and anxiety-inducing. I that's why I'm like I think I'm gonna take a moment out. I I don't know how the people that are are hyper involved with Twitter. You know, a lot of celebrities or politicians. Um, I I do not know how they do it when they're tweeting like literally ten times a day. They're and they're angry just all all the time. At least on Twitter, I I don't know how that doesn't affect their psyche and their 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 life. I I it was a bad influence. I, I I saw it in real time. Um, the effect that it can have on our mood. Um, so my boyfriend, he's not on social media at all whatsoever, and you know I am, and it was it's kind of a light episode or example. So that's part that's probably a good thing. Uh, when do do you watch Game of Thrones? 
Yes. This, so there was all the outrage over the finale. I won't say anything else about it, but um, you know, he was he was not happy with how it ended. And then uh, the next day, like he was over it. Like he didn't really think about it. He was just like, ah, oh, it sucked. I was disappointed with it, whatever. And then I come rolling along and I'm like, oh my God, you have to see all these things on Twitter. They're so funny. All these memes, everyone's so angry. And I saw him like, it, it's the rage start rising in him again. And I, I did that for like a week before I actually started realizing it. I was like, I keep bringing this anger back to him. And he was like over it. He was done. And I keep bringing yeah. it. And that's a small example. That's just a TV show. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and people who are, you know, if you put that uh, into a divisive subject matter, uh, you know, then you have people perpetually angry. That's, that, that is not uh, conducive to a, uh, any meaningful conversation or any conversation that may progress from A to B. It's just perpetually stuck in this, you know, really vicious cycle of just, you know, when you're really angry, you can't really make uh, informed decisions or you don't really hear the other person because your anger is so all-consuming. And I'm not saying anger is, is, is unnecessary. Sometimes you need to be angry about things. Uh, but, you know, it's important to take a step back from that and that environment so you can actually then, all right, this happened. I got angry. I'm okay. Now what do I do about it? Like your boyfriend decided, you know what? It was a shitty ending uh, and then the next day, he goes on with his life. You I can't do that's that the way. Yeah, but you can't do that if you're on social media. You just cannot. So yeah. Um, we, we also had on Lenore Skenazy, and she was talking about um, social media and also the 24-hour news cycle. And she was saying uh, specifically in regards to, to parents and the anxiety that a lot of parents have now and overprotecting their kids because of it. Um, and she was saying that, you know, there's something in our brains that because, like, TV isn't supernatural to us, um, it re-watching the same news story over and over and over does something to our brain where it makes us think deep down that that same incident is actually happening over and over and over. And her example was like a, watching a news story on a child being kidnapped. Um, you know, our brains, every time you see a headline on that story or a picture of the missing child or something like that, it, it kind of makes you think it's actually happening like a hundred times. And it does this weird thing to our to our, our brains, apparently. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I love reading about neuroscience. I remember recently reading a, a, um, a book called Shallows. I forgot the name of the author. Um, and it is really a study uh, about what is happening to our brain when we are online. And I, I, it's kind of similar. And, uh, you know, your re rewiring of your brain happens within the first few hours of you being online. Um, and, you know, and that's what the data suggests. Like if you're, you know, there's the, you know, a controlled study of a group of people that were uh, partaking in a social media uh, group and activity for a very long time and their brain uh, was scanned and they, you, know, you have the uh, uh, wiring of their brain. And then a group of people were introduced to that scenario uh, for like three or four hours and their brains were scanned before and after. And they could already see the rewiring happening in literally hours. Wow. And just uh, reading things like that, I'm like, you know, th th this has to somehow, this has to change. You know, we, we can't keep doing this. I mean, we're not going to evolve our way out of this. I, I think the change is happening too quick. We're not made for things like this. Right. I know it's almost like they need some kind of like option where you can turn the algorithm off if, if you want. I don't know if that if that's an option now. Yeah, thing, right. So if they do that, then that is going to uh, hurt their bottom line. Right? right. I mean, their entire business is based around that algorithm, which is it would be amazing if you do it. I mean, the problem is, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, when, when people have arguments about capitalism, you talk about. Easily, you talk about pharmaceutical companies and Fortune 500 companies. If you, you know, and you talk about media, Rupert Murdoch comes in and things like that. But if you really look at it right now, our world is primarily governed by a handful of tech companies, and the control they have over humanity, uh, regardless of what their intentions are, it it should worry all of us. You know, like I, I have an Android phone and. 
most of my activities is governed, monitored, and control may not be the right word, but to a certain degree controlled by Google. I, I, you know, where I go, uh, you know, my next meeting, um, uh, you know, my email, my, my communica primary communication apparatus for my business, you know, email, it's all managed by this one entity. Um, and then, you know, the, the entertainment I consume on YouTube, same entity, like, I can't escape Google. You can't live in a world, in, in, in the West at least, without Google, whether we like it or not. And then, you know, I travel a lot. And when I, I, I was in India recently and, um, you know, I wanted to catch a cab and I don't want to just jump on a cab. I'm on Uber and I realized I use Uber all around the world, wherever it's available. All of a sudden, this one entity globally manages my transportation. You know, that can't be, this can't be okay, but they are so big, no one can enter and bring them any meaningful competition uh, unless you have a authoritarian body like, say, the Chinese government, where they prevent from anybody else coming. You know, they create their own version, which itself is massively problematic. So trying to figure out well, how, how do we move forward? What do we do? Do you know of, of any, if there are any competitors trying to compete, even as like difficult as it might be, because, you know, Google is a total behemoth. But I, I know of, um, there. I know there's like Minds, which to be honest, I'm not sure on the details yet, but I know they're trying to make some noise in the space and their, their whole thing is touting like open source and, uh, you know, free speech and things like that. Do you know of any other companies like that? I honestly don't know. Uh, when I was in India, I saw massive billboards and ads for a search engine called JB. Uh, again, it seemed quite customized to an Indian audience. Um, and I don't know how that will work in a sort of a global scale. I've seen some ads that pop up um, uh, called DuckDuckGo, which is another search engine. But again, from a uh, perspective of new technology, I don't know anything out there. That is challenging. And it, you know, from a search engine perspective, from Google, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. so you mentioned your uh, feminist uh, event situation a couple times, and I, I wanted to ask you about that because it kind of falls in, like, I think, the the aftermath of that event, which it sounds like you weren't really expecting, uh, kind of falls in line with this conversation of social media and just the state of... of uh, or probably the lack of conversation today. Um, so th this was actually the reason or how I first found out about you and what compelled me to reach out was uh, you had this event. Um, uh, it was a conversation about feminism with feminists, uh, Christina Hoff Summers and Roxane Gay. And there were a couple reasons why it kind of spoke to me after I watched it. Um, the first one was just that I, I really appreciated how you as a moderator seemed to really work towards maintaining a balance and a fairness for both panelists, uh, Christina and Roxanne, which I feel like a lot of people these days who are putting on these events are either unable or unwilling to do. Um, so I really appreciated that. But another reason was that I was, I was really interested in your experience with trying to find a moderator for the event before eventually settling on yourself. Um, are you able to explain what happened? I, I've been running, as I mentioned earlier, I've been running events for a very long time. It's always mine being behind the scenes, never being a person to be in front. Um, if I ever have been, it is just talking about business and entrepreneurship and my immigrant experience. So this was an unusual scenario. And I know a lot of people still don't buy this story and don't believe me when I say this, but this is truth, what happened. When we announce an event, we've never had any trouble finding a host. We announce a tour and then within minutes, people email me or message me saying, I'd love to host. That is something that is historically, whatever we've done has happened. This event that didn't happen, I didn't think too much about it. And um, about two months, three months out of the event, I started reaching out to people uh, to potentially host. And as I mentioned at the, uh, during the intro of my event, um, we, these events aren't just sort of, you know, just randomly plucked out. I, some, a certain amount of thought goes behind these events. So, you know, we always have a preferred list of hosts. And the criteria we normally look into 
is the person ha you know shouldn't be uh, on either side of the spectrum. It should be somebody with uh, a capacity to have good conversation uh, and also a bit of a profile. Uh, whether their person is a journalist or a comedian or a television personality, uh, even an academic uh, that, that's able to have these kind of conversations. So I went through a list. Uh, initially, I had about five people in mind. I reached out to all of them. I, the first person, my, my top pick, is a award-winning Australian journalist. I won't name, uh, uh, name her, but she got back to me like 10 minutes saying, no, thanks. Uh, her response was to the point, no thanks, but thank you for thinking of me. And I was like, oh, okay, no problem. Um, she didn't give me no reason. Next person, uh, you know, was polite to say, uh, thank you for thinking of me, but, uh, you know, I'm going to pass on this one. Uh, do let, you know, do let me know if there's anything else. Uh, the next person uh, was something along the lines of, let me get back to you. But it, I could really sense something is not right. So I kept on trying. You know, 10 people later, I couldn't find anyone. And when you organize an event like this, there's a lot of moving parts and we are a small organization. So we were busy organizing the event and marketing the event. And, you know, three weeks out, we're like, oh, we don't have a host. What do we do? And that's when uh, one of the people I reached out to, she's a friend of mine. She's also an award-winning journalist. Uh, off the record, we caught up for a dinner and she said, you know, you should get a, 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 you know, a man to host it. And I was like, oh, that's going to be controversial in itself. I don't want controversy for the sake of controversy. And she then explained to me her logic and it made perfect sense. And then she hinted, um, you know, you should consider. And I got some advice from a few people and uh, I thought, okay, all right, I'll, I'll host it. I, uh, I asked Roxanne, uh, before uh, the event, um, uh, when she landed in Australia, a few days before the event, I asked her, are you okay if I host it? She was fine with it at that point. I asked, uh, actually, before I even asked Christina, uh, Christina proposed it to me. She's like, I know you don't have a host yet. Why aren't you hosting it? So she proposed it before I could say anything. So I was very happy. And I said, I'm thinking of doing it. Uh, I, let, I would ask Roxanne if she's comfortable with it. And that was the... Hey, that's what led to me hosting the event. So why do you think so many people declined in the first place? Um, so I've been given, the on, there's only one person that gave me, it's, it's my friend, uh, the journalist. She was the only one who told me why. Um, actually, sorry, uh, let me correct myself. One of the well-known feminists, uh, it's now public knowledge, so, so I can mention, um, she mentioned that she strongly disagreed with Christina of Summers so she would be a hypocrite to share the stage with Christina. That's why she didn't want to host it. Everybody else just didn't give me a reason. And the only person that gave me a reason, she said, um, I can't be honest on stage because there are things I disagree with Roxanne. There are things I agree with Christina. But if I do that publicly as part of uh, my organization and my public profile, I will lose my job. I would be called, uh, you know, right wing nut job. Uh, I can't risk it. So she said, chances are almost everyone you're reaching out to is scared to host this because it's a very toxic area. You know, that's why I no longer go to feminist events, um, you know, because, you know, it just frustrates me because no longer conversations are happening. It's just each group is preaching to their own audience. And I, I, I thought like, but that's, this is a perfect place to, you know, have that conversation, but she's like, well, kudos to you, but I don't want to be the person on stage. I'll be in the audience watching. So, you know, it's funny here. We, we, we've had on um, guests on both sides of the feminist conversation. And so we've got, we've received that reaction a little bit ourselves. Why, why do you think this is, I mean, not just feminism in general, I, I think controversial topics as a whole, why is it come back to our conversation about like, people not being able to have conversations. How do you think it's gotten this bad? Um, I think, uh, you know, again, it goes back to the what we spoke about with regards to social media. Um, social media has somewhat leveled the playing field. Um, you know, uh, anecdotal evidence. Uh, I remember Neil deGrasse Tyson tweeting about 
a scientific fact. He tweets about it, and one of the first comments that uh, somebody came up with saying, well, you're wrong, uh, and they had their own opinion. And there's this false idea that's given to people is your opinion is about a certain subject matter is as valid as an expert's opinion on that subject matter. It's not to say all experts are always right, but we have experts for a reason. You know, we don't try to diagnose ourselves, we go see a doctor. So, you know, if there's a qualified doctor, we, t we value their opinion. So when I saw that, it kind of hit me like, this is what people think. Somehow an astrophysicist uh, is, claims a scientific fact and, you know, some person, uh, you know, somewhere on Twitter thinks their opinion is as valued or potentially better than Neil's opinion or rather Neil's scientific fact. Right, people have missed the point in order what is an opinion and what is a empirical fact. Right, and social media plays up to creating in groups in groups of people who agree with your potential opinion slash fact. And more and more people have that, and you keep on that journey for a long time, and then you go into real world. And then you can no longer have that conversation because you've either forgotten or you never you were never part of a conversation. You were part of this pseudo conversation online, which is having a go at the other and getting a massive group of agreement among your own people. So I think that that's why we we've sort of we're no longer having conversations. We've lost the art of conversation. Uh, well, I, and I think what's so interesting is that I guess. I guess in the conversation of social media, I think for us, like, <laughs> everyday non-intellectuals, um, you know, it would make sense that we would kind of fall into these rabbit holes because we don't know any better. I think what's so strange with the feminism event was that you had scholars uh, talking and when trying to reach out to different moderators, I mean, you were saying award-winning journalists, I guess I would have thought that they would have known a little bit better than to have fallen into these th this like tribalism problem, but it doesn't seem that way. I mean, look, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really valid point you make, but I think some of them, it was about the public image. And, you know, that's sort of, you know, my conversation with that one journalist, a friend of mine, kind of highlights that where, uh, you know, whatever she says publicly is not necessarily what she actually thinks or what she doesn't want to say publicly because, you know, we do have, you know, sort of outrage culture, the cancel culture, so they don't want to be a part of it. And there's this other thing, I mean, we, you know, we, we talk about in our movie where, your intentions are good. You want to do the right thing by the people that you want, you know, the, the minorities and the group of people that may not have a voice. Um, and there's a group of people that, because you're not sure how to talk about it, the, the default position is, let me just not talk about it. You know, and that's also part of the problem. And that all, again, stems from this outrage and cancel culture. So people are genuinely worried about it talking about something and you know people are also worried about saying well, I don't know or not taking a side I mean not taking a side itself seems uh, it's deemed on, on in, in this in this world somehow a bad thing right you know you 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 either for or against us period against right. binary of the world period right I, I know I feel like there's like this pressure to be involved to have an opinion. Right. Yeah. You see this with uh, a lot of companies, too. It's like I see all these companies coming out with these hyper political ads and stances. And it's like, I guess if, if you if you as a company and a team truly feel that way, fine. But I, I almost feel like it's a marketing ploy where this, these marketers came in and they were like, hey, guys, this is what the people want. They want us to take a stand. Let's try doing something. And oftentimes they like fail <laughs> tragically. But, but, but oftentimes they also succeed. Right. True. And, True. Uh, you know, like what, what Nike did, uh, you know, Nike knew their audience, you know, the sneaker buying audience is tend to be you know, there's, there's a very large portion of that are minorities. Uh, and when you play up uh, what you want to play up to that audience, you're going to sell a whole heap of sneakers. Uh, and that, that, that that's an example of it, it working. I mean, I try to do um events uh 
uh, that goes all over the spectrum. I remember, uh, you know, when when I when I did the event with Majid Nawaz, um, there was a you know large group of people really didn't like me doing that event, and uh, back then I was reading comments and people were trying to figure out what's what's this what's this guy's you know agenda? What is he trying to do? Um, and you know, they couldn't pigeonhole me because. You have the event with Sam Harris and Majid Nawaz, and then the Majid Nawaz alone event, which they wanted to categorize as somehow a right-wing propaganda. But then the next event announced what is Dr. Cornell West. You know, so all of a sudden, wait, if he's right-wing, why is he working with Dr. West? You know, who's you know the darling of the left. You know, he's a fantastic intellectual. I love both Sam Harris and Cornell West. They're both intellectuals in their own right. And but but you can't do that. If you're MSNBC or if you're CNN, CNN cannot take a even remotely if there is a neutral or pro-Trump uh, situation, they cannot take that because they build the current form of CNN is anti-Trump. It is, you know, that's how it works. I and mean, they've built that brand and they now have to run with it. Fox cannot be anything other than anti-democrats. It's just, that's the brand, that's, that's what it is. So when you have, uh, you know, Candy Jones and all these different people on either side of the spectrum, they have to play to their audience. And that's the problem, right? When you're playing to your audience, regardless of what facts hit your face, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty crazy how um, plan uh, I, for kind of lack of a, a better word and less controversial word, um, how planned and kind of manipulated these um, like mainstream channels are. You know, again, that's something that we're trying to fight against. I mean, we've heard from several insiders who who have gone on mainstream channels quite a bit, and they've said, "Oh, I've I, they asked me for my opinion ahead of time, and it wasn't what they wanted to hear, so they canceled my appearance." Or um, I think the ratings went down uh, for MSNBC when uh, the um, they found out that Trump or was wasn't colluding with Russia. Or, you know, the report came out and they didn't indict him um, because that's what they had built their entire show on the last two years. Their ratings plummeted right after that, from what I heard. Yeah, I mean, see, this is the thing, right? You know, CNN apologized for their part in getting Trump elected because they have you know, end-to-end -end Trump rallies, but I think that was disingenuous. I, I think they, you know, like right now, do you think they're going to stop talking about Trump? Hell no, that entire place is based around, I mean, there are certain comedians, their entire monologues and the whole thing is based around Trump, 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 attacking Trump. I mean, the thing is, it, you know, I'm not saying don't talk about the president of America, the world has to talk about him, but the way the, the media talks about him is it, it plays straight into the hand of Trump. And Trump, you know, you can't avoid him because media keeps giving him a, a, a platform. Yesterday it was about what he said about Meghan, uh, you know, and today it's about what he said about uh, um, um, the mayor of London. You know, tomorrow it'll be, I don't know, he, he walked funny somewhere. <laughs> It's just there will be something because of the personality of the man they are reporting on. There's always going to be something, but everything is at like, oh, my God, it's here, constantly here. Right. And that, that that's the irony of it is that because everything is always at level 10, that if he ever does something that's like undeniably uh, bad or controversial or whatever, nobody really pays attention because everything they talk about is is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, that's the problem. And and look, I appreciate you know what you're doing. There are outlets uh, out there that's um, uh, trying to sort of buck the trend. Um, but the challenging situation is if you look at the data, it's not like people have left mainstream, especially television. Television audience are you know, growing a little bit, not a exponentially, but it's, 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 there was a trend that it went down, but it's now back up and it's staying there. So people are consuming more content or on digital mediums and consuming traditional media. So um, my worry is information overload, right? You know, if you put a conscious effort, you can pick, for example, you know, podcasts. I listen to Ezra Klein and Sam Harris. Uh, you know, because I know they, they don't necessarily agree on things, but you know, but I don't think 
everyone puts in that much effort to figure out, all right, I'm going to listen to this bit and this bit and blah, 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 blah. Again, I hope, you know, there will be things that people don't categorize in, in, uh, to take a side. It's neutral enough so people will go back to what news or current affairs or uh, entertainment programs that used to be. It doesn't necessarily take a stance per se. It's relatively neutral. Right? That's what news should be. That, that's what I say. I say, I want my news boring and factual. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, but maybe we are being idealistic. Maybe, you know, the, the, the news as we know it is something in the past. Maybe today's news is entertainment. I mean, uh, in the, uh, the, the New York Magazine article about the incident of feminist, they refer to a Sydney Morning Herald article. Sydney Morning Herald is one of the biggest publications in this country. And that journalist, the way she reported the event, uh, you read that article, you read the New York Magazine article, uh, you know, the article was, I don't know, about you know, 800 words versus 5,000 words. You have a journalist who did his research and wrote that article. Then you had somebody who attended one event and wrote about the entire tour uh, uh, from one perspective. It was an opinion piece, but reported mm -hmm. as news. And I was reading that and I called that journalist. I'm like, you know, that's not what happened. You had an interview with me. Why did you exclude this part and this part? Because if you include those two parts, your entire story changes. And her response was, well, I don't have 2,000 words to write everything. But I'm like, by excluding this part, you change the narrative fundamentally. And she refused to uh, change the article. and just stuck by it. See, and that's what's so scary is that you have, I, I feel like so many so-called journalists now are actually commentators or activists. And they're, Absolutely. they're being just trusted as journalists. And I, I feel like because we try to be like hyper aware of it, it, it it's like you, all you do is read the 500 word one. You're like, oh, well, this is clearly an unresearched opinion piece, but it's not labeled as such. And I think people not paying attention probably wouldn't think that. And um, yeah. With my, my request for that journalist was, okay, you have the right to write anything, right? But at least label it as an opinion piece. If that's, that was my request. I didn't ask her, I asked, why did you do it? But I didn't ask her to necessarily change an article. I simply said, turn it, like, title it as an opinion, which is fine. You ask, you're, you're right to have an opinion. But when it was reported as a news article, uh, that's when you have a skewed, like whoever's reading it, you know, on your uh, social media feed very quickly. It's an easy read, very quick read, and you then form an opinion about something based on a fundamentally flawed set of information. Well, and, and I've heard that um, there might actually be a benefit to that, or at least not bad consequences, because the way that, um, you know, you probably know this, but how a lot of uh, uh, monetizations work online with articles and video content and whatnot is that usually it's it, it's whatever the first hit of the pieces or of traffic. So when you first put a piece out, however much traction it gets the first like hour or day dictates how well it's going to do and how much money you'll make. And then after that, it kind of falls off. So yes. unfortunately, platforms kind of have a an uh, incentive to make things like to, to not focus on the truth and focus on what their readers want to see. And then, cause they can always go back and do a retraction, but they've already made, at least they've made the money from the drama. And then that, that, that is, that goes back to something we spoke right at the beginning. It's exactly how uh, monetization works. Uh, you know, uh, it's how Google AdWords work, uh, whatever programmatic platforms out there for any, uh, uh, you know, online platform to make money. Unfortunately, that's how it works. So you, you're right. There is no monetary incentive unless uh, you know you build enough of an audience through uh, that that supports you to do the right thing, whether it is through a subscription basis uh, or, or some other basis. You're right. No real organization has that inbuilt, and that is something that we as a collective have to figure out how do we change this. We, we this cannot keep going on. We have to fundamentally change things. I mean, for me, dragging people from their lounges 
to from their homes to a live event is crucial because that human interaction is i believe is quite important for you to change a position or understand a position again referring to that meeting i had just before this was uh, this young lady was telling me how she dragged her boss who had certain views about feminism uh, and when he came there he he in the next few days he apparently became a better human being after that experience of the event he had started understanding some of the things that you know why feminists do some of the things they do regardless of you know some the, 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 as he called it apparently a traumatic experience because he was one of the very few men there and he uh, he used the word he was worried that he was going to get lynched for being a man there <laughs> that's <laughs> traumatic <laughs> of course but but the point is uh, you know live events have an impact and and you know you know one of the things we could potentially do is take away uh, take a step back from the giant online environments and have more uh, one on one conversations you know go back to a scenario where uh, the, the, the the human one on one conversations have more of it. how do we do more of that effective it kind of back to what you were saying about um, that event you had where you um, you made all the different groups uh, live together for a few days. Yeah, I mean, so that was a very different kind of event. That was, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the impact of that is, it's, you know, it's seen now, um, uh, you know, you, it, it, a country's future was defend, depending on that. Like, so Sri Lanka will never go back to another sectarian war it was important we work with youth leaders. If they weren't being indoctrinated. It was just simple human connection. And what really drove it home in a country like Sri Lanka and the subcontinent, the biggest sport is cricket. So we put them in cricket teams. And, uh, you know, after the first game, they were cheering for their cricket team, which was made out of multiple ethnicities. Then they forgot their own ethnicity. They were cheering for that particular team. And then, you know, that kind of sort of then at the end of the five days, they worked out, you know, we're all the same. It just sort of, but activities and that real life interaction drove it home. You know, they can read about it. You know, all of them have read about being kind to each other, respecting other cultures, but then they had, they lived through it. They had this one-on-one -on -one experience, which then drove it home. So I heard someone say once, I can't remember who it was, but, but they were talking about how important it is that we try and maintain our um, communal hobbies as much as possible, like sports or concerts or or whatever. And the point was that, like, as trivial as these things might seem, they're actually incredibly important in try in getting everyone out of their heads, out of their these strong opinions and issues that we're talking about, to come together for something kind of fun and that you can unite on because it's not, I mean, let's say sports, like it's a sport, you know, like it, it's not politics. Like it, you can easily unite with someone you disagree with on every other issue to cheer on a team. And, and their point was, was just how important that is to, to like a society and a community. And I, I thought it was a really good point. I completely agree with it, and and you know, in in a, in a strange way, what I want to do is, how do we get thousands of thousands of people come to intellectual events and have sort of that communal effect? You don't have to agree with that person, right? And, you know, and, and uh, later today, I I will be sitting down with uh, Omaima. Her tweet uh, went viral on the back of the feminist event, as uh, she is an ex-Muslim who was in the audience, and uh, her comment was, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but something along the lines of. She felt betrayed by the feminist movement, uh, the Western feminist movement, as an ex-Muslim woman who was sitting in the audience and listening to Roxanne and her response. Uh, she felt quite alienated, and seeing that sort of, you know, how the crowd reacted to the response of Roxanne, which is online, you can watch it. Um, Do you, would you and, mind actually recapping that quickly, just so people know the context? Yeah. Sure. So the context is, um, uh, I had a question to Roxanne primarily. Uh, do Western feminists have a bigger role to play when it comes to uh, activists in countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, where countries they are genuinely oppressed? Um, and her response was, yes, but the activists in those countries know better. I'm paraphrasing, but you can listen to the full explanation. And Roxana has said that in the past, which I personally think is 
uh, a bit of a cop out. I think it's not really a genuine answer. Uh, it's this idea of you know it's their culture. They know best. Let's not tell them what to do because who are we to tell them what to do? But when it comes to uh, you know uh, certain aspects of life, regardless of your culture, uh, if your culture tells me. Uh, you know, marrying and uh, raping uh, young children is an okay thing. Fuck your culture. I will, you know, I will say it, it's a universal thing that everybody across the world should be able to say. It's not partisan to say that. And just like that, that you know, being able to challenge uh, certain cultural norms, uh, you know, from a feminist perspective, should be quite normal. But it doesn't happen. So I asked that question, but I also presented a video from Indonesia where. The Sharia police, uh, by the way, the video is from a very progressive network over here, uh, where the Sharia police is policing these young women who are fully covered, uh, you know, going about their day and stopping them and detaining them for the fact their jeans are too tight. And the, the Sharia police says these awful, awful things. And I wanted to present it uh, and, and ask the question, you know, how do you respond to something like this? And, you know, I was pillared for that question. Uh, Roxanne and her audience thought it was very manipulative of me trying to represent that culture with that video clip. I'm like, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm asking this one specific question. Um, and that response was uh, from Roxanne, it was like, who are we to tell them what to do kind of response, which Omaima, who was in the audience, she's an ex-Muslim, she's an activist. Um, she actually wrote an article about her experience. Uh, uh, it was published by Quillette. Um, and, uh, you know, she felt quite alienated by that response, and rightfully so, because, again, it's a copa. That's not really a response. So, and I'm sorry, what you, you, you had mentioned her because you guys are going to be working together? Yeah, so later today, I was invited by the IDW uh, Sydney uh, for a conversation with her, um, and it's, it, I think it's a small gathering. We're just going to have a conversation about, um, I think the uh, title of the event is, uh, hold on, let me, let me get that. I don't want to get this wrong. Um, it is called, uh, We Need to Talk About Feminism. And, uh, you know, my mind and I, we're just going to have a bit of a conversation. It's going to uh, start from what happened at this event and, you know, what it means for the movement um, and the byproduct of that. And, uh, you know, and, and the, the, the articles that came out, the publications and the ongoing conversation online about post-event and what it means to the ex-Muslim movement um, and things like that. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.